Hi, I'm Jake, purchasing agent at Amico, providing you with everything you need for clay. This episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find your favorite Amico glazes or Brent equipment at your local distributor. Cheers for listening. Happy glazing. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 453 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Wesley Brown. He combines throne forms with thick slabs to make sculptures and pottery that feels monumental both in their emotion and scale. He's currently teaching at East Stroudsburg University in eastern Pennsylvania, and he has a show on display at their Madeline Powers Gallery until March the 3rd. If you're interested in seeing examples of his work, you can go to his website. That's wesleytbrown.com. Before we get to that episode, I wanted to plug the podcast room that's happening at this year's Inseca conference. There's going to be six hour-long tapings from folks that are hosting popular podcasts, including The Maker's Playbook, The Potter's Cast, Wheel Talk, The Mud Peddlers, Potters of Color 2.0, Trade Secret, For Flex Sake, The Kiln Sitters, The Shot Callers, and also my own. So all these folks will be hosting episodes during Thursday and Friday, March the 16th and 17th. And the way the room is going to work is that you'll be able to come in and take part in these recordings and ask questions. So make sure to check that out in room 212 at this year's Enseca in Cincinnati. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's first start talking about the work you did in grad school. Your thesis show was called Monumental, and and they were large-scale ceramic works. So can you describe that work? That work was huge in itself, but it was also a major undertaking to get to that point. Uh, I had had always been about pots and about the wheel, and it was through grad school that I realized that I had to really get away from that if I was going to create something new. That work uh, came out of struggle, uh, and the struggle was uh, my first year. I was I, I I remember I got to grad school, and I had these ideas that I needed to make something grandiose and something big. And I had gotten into grad school from undergrad. Um, my ending portfolio that I entered with was work on race. And so I was like, I need to make some bold statements. And I spent weeks paralyzed. I could not think of anything new. Um, And there were a number of reasons for that. And I remember meeting with Malcolm Mabutu Smith, who's my professor, and just being like, "I, I don't know what to do. And he was just like, make anything, something. And so I started making work and I I think I did a good job for the first year. And the second year, uh, my life kind of got turned upside down. Uh, I ran into a number of struggles. And so I I realized that I couldn't keep working on the wheel because it was cyclical. And my life was not cyclical. It was not coming around. And so I started texturing. I took a textiles course. This is the fast bullet point. Uh, And so I started 
getting really rough with the clay and making these large pots. And then eventually my professors would just like, why do they have to be pots? Lose the vessel. And so I jettisoned the vessel. I threw on some narrative stuff and it didn't take me. It, it became actually constrictive. I had a visiting artist come in. They gave me some words about it. And I said, okay, I'll let it go. I'll just let the pieces be the pieces. I'll start building without a plan. And that's where everything started to go into making these really large monumental pieces. And they were all like somewhere between two and 400 pounds each. And it, it was a lot of fun to make them. <laughs> and by the end, you know, you get, you had to get into the logistics of like, how do you move them out of the studio? Uh, and there's, there's something about making big work that uh, it teaches you a lot and you run into a lot of problems that you, you never knew you were going to have until you have them. Uh, so that work was, was huge in that it was this way for me to, to think about how my life had been going and how it had been a struggle. And so I struggled in making the work physically of, of combining and getting all of that mass together. It, it was just a, it was just a really big undertaking. I was very happy with the work in the end. Do you think it was important to have the physical struggle match the internal struggle? Oh, definitely. I think uh, I, I, have a Christian background. So I, I don't remember a time in my life where I wasn't in church. My parents raised us in that environment, went to private Christian schools, K through 12. And so there was always this talk when I hit junior high. And that's really where you can start to, you start to develop your own personality. You start to actually push off of your parents. You start deciding what things are you, and what things are them. It's the very beginnings of it. You don't, I don't think you really get fully, I didn't get fully into it till I got into my twenties. But um, one of the things that, that we talked about to the point where, you know, I can't hear this word without having flashbacks is the word authentic. Cause we'd always be saying the authentic Christian life. Are you living your authentic self? Is it real? Are you living out your faith for Jesus? Like, what does it look like for you? And so when I make work, I want it to be me. And so much of my early formative years were, are you doing it? Is it real? Is it real to you? And so when I'm making work, I'm just like, I need it to be, I need it to be something. I can't fake it. There's this like huge fear of like, am I just faking this? Is this actually me? And so making work that had that physicality to it. Um, that had that struggle that matched how I was inside. It was, I think, at, without that upbringing, I don't think I would have been able to make the work that I was or even doing today because it's just, there's this part of me that's always been conditioned to be as real on the outside as you are on the inside. Did that create a lot of pressure though? Because I, I do think that in art, in grad school, we're constantly questioning, and that's that's the modality of learning. And I also think there's a parallel to that in your faith life, where through questioning and, and interrogation, self-interrogation, you come to a greater um, sort of understanding of both yourself, but also the divine or whatever the belief system that you're working within. But it's the method itself is about pressure. It's like, let's let's a question to a point where a breakthrough happens. So can you talk a little about that pressure if you if you felt that? Oh, definitely. There is this I, I would say there's pressure, but the the word for me would probably be more so like doubt. Like is what I'm doing true? In the faith system, for me it was like I've been taught this for so long have I actually interrogated what I've been taught? And then the same thing happens when you're making work and you go into critique and people are, especially in grad school critiques, they're really hammering on you. Why this decision? Why not that decision? Why this, not that? Why this, what not that? Have you seen this? Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? This reminds me of that and that and that. 
And so you come out of critique going like uh, my best, my best metaphor is you come into critique with a bouquet and you're like, it's the most beautiful thing. And you leave with a stem. (laughs) And then your goal is to go into the studio and go, okay, well, I know that I just got pruned and that's not me. And that's not me. Or I couldn't defend that. I couldn't defend this, but I have this one little thing. Let me put it in water. Let me grow it up again into something new. And then every time you go in, you're going to come up with something a little bit more you. And so, yeah, it's absolutely necessary. I think it was, yeah, that, that process, I would say it's the, is this real? The doubt of like, am I actually making the right thing that's true to me? And then the same in faith is like, am I actually believing something that isn't itself true or am I, have I just spent so much time doing it that I think it is? And I think the role of other people in both of these scenarios is really important. You know, like I know in in my own spiritual path, having people I trust to be able to say the, say the doubts out loud. It's the same thing in grad school, like having people that I really trusted around me and my cohort that I could sort of bounce ideas off and not feel any judgment. Because I think part of the negative part of that pressure of grad school is often feeling like if my work is judged negatively, then I am judged negatively. But I found that a good friend group can help you to see like, that's actually not true. Work is work. You are you. (laughs) We're talking about the object. You can still be a good person, even if the object needs some work. Mm. I agree with that statement. I don't, I said that I always spent a good amount of time (laughs) uh, combining those two, my personal worth and the worth of the work and combining them. I I wouldn't say that I have uh, necessarily the most healthy of detachments (laughs) between the two, but yeah, it's definitely having people around you who can tell you what you're doing. Um, for me, the critique was was necessary in that way, but it was also spending, I'd say for me, it, it it's usually been an isolation thing, like getting off by myself and really drilling in, putting, if it was in the studio, then it's going into the studio and drilling into it. And then on the other end, on the other side of it, it's been for faith, it's been looking up lectures and looking up historians and listening to their accounts and like, how do they come to these theories or how do they come to these ideas? So for me, it's always been this really very private examination. So I had some questions about the way that the work is made now versus the monumental work. We should say that that monumental work, as you mentioned, hundreds of pounds, very large, like got to have multiple people to move that stuff. Yep. But now you're taking elements of that, putting them into functional work, and they still have that monumental feeling, but the scale itself is much, much smaller. So in terms of process, how do you distill, or in your mind, how did you distill the actual monumental work into mark making that has the same sort of qualities of the previous work, but it's physically way, way smaller. I'd say the first person who ever threw the idea into my mind of scale would be my professor, Tim Mather. He, he was the first one who said like, Oh, a work can be big, but not be large in space. Um, it's the attitude of the work. I didn't, I heard it then, but I wouldn't actually understand it for several years. The way that I came to making stuff that'll actually fit on a table to getting back into functional work was making the move from grad school to Baltimore Clayworks for my first year out, which is a one year long term residency. And realizing that uh, making large sculptures was just not going to pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, not to say that my pots were really making bills. At that point, it was just like, can we get the pots to, can we make stuff, not even pots? Can I just make something that will sell so that I can buy more clay so that I can keep doing this? And it was like, well, I, I've always been a I always made pots, but then I stopped and made sculpture. 
what if I just had the two together? So what I did was I was like, well, I like the texture. I know how to make that texture. I like the physicality of making it so I can roll out slabs. I can build it. I was like, well, what if I just build a base? And then I take a simple form. And I was like, well, what's a simple ceramics form? Nothing complicated. You want to keep it simple. A bowl. It's like, okay, bowls. Bowls can be centerpieces. Bowls can go on tables. I can make a bowl that people will recognize as a bowl. But at the same time, it can be a centerpiece. Okay, well, let's just take that texture and let's just take a bowl and like physically just picture it just falling straight down and hitting that. And what would it look like? So I, I made something like a cube or rectangular and I just cut out the dips and made a bowl and literally sat it in there. And was just like, that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> and I eventually learned, hey, I can actually manipulate the textures and get them around the bowl and make something that looks really solid. And then it was at a short-term residency of a few weeks at uh, East Mitchell Clay or Campaigning Gallery with Eric uh, Bockville. He invited me out that I really was just like, okay, I can, I can really try. And he, he really challenged me, uh, especially for cups. He was like, I want, he's like, can you make a mug? Something we can sell a little easier. And I made the first version of a mug and he, he like held it in his hands and he was just like, this is, uh, mm, like, this is the concept of a mug and it's nice, uh, but this is not practical. <laughs> no one is going to drink out of this, uh, uh do it again but better. <laughs> and I was just like, message received, message received. And so I realized, hey, I can actually, if I take a cylinder, I can kind of sawtooth cut it and seat it one into the other so that they have the boundaries, but they're kind of pushing past each other and get this real integration of both. And that, that really opened it wide up wide open and then i was like oh i can do that with jars and i can do that with teapots oh my gosh and so that's that's where it's been i, I feel like i i've been like every year i'm adding maybe one form so like i know i can do teapots i know i can do bowls i can do mugs i can do you know me's i can do vases um i'm thinking about pictures it's a crazy idea i've been sketching them out have not been able to figure out how to make those two meet in a way that feels right. Um, but yeah, figuring that out. And so you're, I'm taking all of that texture and, and really distilling it and then bringing in wheel thrown elements and matching them together. It's, it's really exciting. At, at least for me, like, because no two pieces are the same. And so you're constantly having to problem solve. And I can't remember who said it. Uh, someone said as a, that there are always rules. Yeah, I remember it was, a, it was a clinical psychologist and they were talking about games and how humans are wired to play games, especially in childhood. Um, but he said, he's like, well, if I look at you and I say, let's play a game and you go, okay, let's play a game. And he goes, okay, one, two, three, go. Then you'll look at him and you'll just be like, well, what, wait, what are the rules? What's the objective? We don't, I don't know how to play the game. And he's like, cause humans, we need, we need limits. Um, and was it, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson. And he was, he did a talk in Toronto, I want to say with the gallery director for the Toronto Museum, the Canada Museum of Art, talking about creativity. And he said, it's not the limitless uh, nature of things that makes people be creative. In fact, it's actually the opposite. It's having minimal or even... Um, deficient circumstances that makes you be creative because creativity comes from trying to create 
a novel solution to a problem. And so I give myself a lot of rules. I give myself a lot of boundaries. And so within those boundaries, I have to get creative. I have to come up with something new. So like, I don't throw anything with any curves. It's all geometric. And when I'm making stuff, it's like, if I'm making the slabs and they're hand built, it's only flat stuff. I might add a little curve, but past that, no. And so I have to be creative. So let's think about a something like a teapot, which the rules of teapot often have to do with gravity. You know, like you got to get the water out of the <laughs> out of yep. the spout into the cup, mm-hmm. and gravity is is part of that. But in in the studio, wh- how do you? It's a complex form already, and your building style is somewhat complex. So how do you? What are the rules you give yourself for that form? Well, it has to work. It has to function. At the end of the day. I need to be able to put at least two tea bags in there and some boiling water and be able to get that out and use it. It needs to be effective. I want my stuff to function. Um, that's a must. So that that adds a series of rules as far as the height and the opening and the handle needs to be ergonomic. And I'd say past that, it's just kind of like, how do you combine things? And the more that you make them, the more that you realize like, oh, I like it when it does this. I don't like it when it does that. I know this might not be the most, this might not be the most specific answer. Uh, Cause mostly it's, it's just kind of going by feel to figure out what works. There is an intuitive part of this. Cause I watched you in the videos on your Instagram, which I encourage people to check out you. I can see you thinking through how to fit. There was the cylinder that was fitting onto a larger form and you would like put it down, make a mark, cut it. And you were trying to lock and key it basically. Yeah. But it was a process. Like you took it up, you put it down, you took it up, you put it down. But when it really fit was later than I thought. Like I thought, oh, good, he figured it out. And then you would make two or three more cuts and then it really fit. (laughs) And I think it kind of shows that there is some persistence to having it fit in a way that satisfies you. You know, like there's an end point in which you're like, okay, this is solid in the way it's constructed. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, there's something there's, I'm thinking about students now. There's something about like when when you're making something and you know that it's not quite right and you're like i just gotta i gotta work with it a little longer and really work out the kinks like i don't know what's wrong with it and i I think i've been making making the work long enough to the point where i know when i've not gone far enough it's not very often that i feel like i've gone too far it does happen (laughs) But it is not it is not nearly as often as it was. I think I, I heard a quote and I, and I was like, man, you know, I hear a lot of motivational quotes. And someone said, uh, what's the difference between uh, a, a beginner and a master? And it's like the beginner does it till they get it right. And the master does it till he can't get it wrong. And I was just like, oh, I've never never heard that one before. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you you do it so many times. It's like, I'm not doing it till I get it right. I'm doing it to the point where I can't do it wrong. Well, I think some of the process marks that that is a part of this, when do you stop thing? And, and I wanted to talk about when you're touching the slabs, there's a lot of marks, but there's not, it doesn't feel messy. So like, how did you learn how to touch a slab and join it to a thrown part without it not just looking like chaos? Because it seems like the you're touching it intentionally. So how did you develop that? Ooh. Oh, it doesn't look messy. Oh, I feel like it's terribly messy. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a different read. I think it was... Um, I first started doing those textures because I was... Uh, it was a second year of grad school. And I what, what happened between my first and my second year was... I I started working at the Bloomington Clay Studio, which was really awesome, uh, under a guy, Daniel Evans. And I was a GA. I 
a lot of really awesome stuff happened. And I, I found a really good church. I got really good friends in it. Um, and I was able to live in the same city for over a year. I didn't move back in with my parents and I didn't move apart. Well, I did, I did move apartments, but it was in the same city, which hadn't happened in like three years. Cause you know, you, you go to school, summer's over, go back home, then move back in to the dorm and then go back home. And so I actually felt like I actually was able to put down roots and it was the, the changing of that cycle, seeing the pots as being cyclical and saying, okay, I'm going to stop doing that and cutting them and putting a flat side on a pot and then putting those into the wood fire and seeing the flashing or putting wadding on it to see that real drama across the surface. And I was like, well, I like the drama. What if I added texture to that surface to add to the drama? And so when I was first making marks, like I would put the marks in and then you wouldn't get the feedback till the firing, which is a long time. That's a long wait. Uh, and then the firing is a long time. And I'd get them back and I'd be like, well, it's like something, but like, it's not enough. And so it was, it was adding grog to the surface, but like only to the surface or adding grog or feldspar or chicken grit to it. And so by the time I started to make those large sculptures and I was, what I was doing was I learned from textiles was I started doing something I called clay quilting. So I would roll out and wedge chunks of clay. And then I love having concrete floors. It's the best thing to happen. As I take that circular round ball of clay, flatten it a little bit, and then start to throw it out across the floor. And so it catches on the floor and pulls. And you get those little tears, those little micro tears across the surface. And the more you throw it, the more the clay just starts to starts to just rip itself open at its grain lines. And then you're taking those and I do a bunch of them, get a piece of canvas and take those and just start throwing them down and just creating this patchwork. No slipping, no scoring. It's all soft clay that was just thrown across the floor and you're slamming it together. And that gives you something that's very unique in texture, but very, very busy, very chaotic. And so you can, and then I would stiffen that up either flat or usually I, I, uh, I drape it or slump it over something large, usually a five gallon bucket. I had a, I think I had in grad school, like every metal trash can in the studio was in my studio space because if you put it on a regular, it's, you know, get pretty heavy. You put it on a regular trash can, it just smushes it. And so when I started building with those, let them stiffen up to the point where they're leather hard, you can actually stand them up and turn them into a building element. And it was like, well, I could keep building with these, but the problem is, is that they are so packed with texture. It's all texture and it's all texture slammed on top of each other, which is great, but visually there's no rest. And so I was like, well, I've got to, I've, got to have some way to add rest. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just add some regular flat slabs. And it's like, well, they can't be pristine. So I'm going to texture these and texturing those, which for a, a bare slab is a lot. But when contrasted with the essential clay quilting, as I called it, uh, it became the most neutral visual elements on the piece. And it being so large uh, and you having to stand so far back from it to take it in, it really worked. And so now that I've taken just the slab portion and heavy texturing in that, and I'm combining that with the wheel elements, which are smooth, um, cutting it down into those smaller pieces really works. I don't know how it does it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it I'm just happy that it does. 
Well, what I like is that you'll have part of those big, smoother sides of pots. There'll be a couple fingerprints that look, they don't look totally random, but they do look, they do look fresh. And I think it's because of the processes that they're, they're made flat and then applied. So there's this sense of, um, that you're cutting away. Like that's, what's interesting about the work when I first saw it is I couldn't figure like, are you adding this up and cutting it away or is it made just by only addition? And it Uh, sounds like that it is addition. It's not, you're not cutting into the form once it's on the pot, it's already the texture it is. And then you're lock and keying the thrown and non-thrown parts to, to make them fit. Exactly. That, that is, you got it. You got me. (laughs) <laughs> cats out of the bag That's so the, the other part of this in terms of rest that is interesting is that I saw your wood fired work and because the flame path varies so much it does it it makes the work loud but in an unclear way but then when I saw the black all black work which is what it is now it it quiets things down and it makes them have this gravity in terms of like seriousness. It's like very heavy. And actually, I, I heard you talk about this in the interview you did with Nick Torres. Um, I can't remember if he asked you what it, what's the feeling you want people to take away. And your answer was is that I want them to have a sense of sobriety, like a sense of seriousness in the work. And I don't think you said heaviness, but I think of it as emotional heaviness. So can you talk more about how choosing to make it all black gives it an emotional tone and what that tone is for you. I did a talk here at ESU and at the end, and I usually get this question of like, in making my work all black, is it a statement on race? And I'm just like, no, it it's just black. And there's, there's something about, because I was such a big pots guy and because I aspired Early in my ceramics career, I aspired to be a production potter. So I was so interested and so invested in form. It was like glazing, ah, I have to. (laughs) But throwing the form and studying it, the curves, the proportions, that's that's what really drew me. The challenge of that. And so when I was making that work and I was working with the wood fire, another part of that process, struggle, work, earning something. Uh, When I decided that I couldn't continue to wood fire, it was just too time consuming and the results just weren't fully there. I was like, let me, what's the opposite? Let's, if I go back to my roots that I'm thinking about form and if I have these incredibly complex surfaces, but I want you to be able to appreciate the form, why not hide them? And I really have um, professor Chase Gamblin to, to thank on this because my first year I, I made a bunch of really funky looking pots and I was like, man, I just, it'd be cool if I could just make a silhouette and he was like, well, I've got a black clay body. And so I started using a black clay body and I was making all these pots. I was throwing basic like bottles, real, real wide base to a very, very narrow opening and then putting these ridiculous spouts on them. And I remember going to critique and Chris Boger was just like, that's so phallic. And I was just like, no, it's, oh, <laughs> Oh, it is. Wow. Oh, this is just a bunch of, aha. Yeah, I can't, now I can't unsee it. Um, And so I put that stuff away and then I went into wood firing. And so when I decided I'm going to come out of wood firing uh, and just try and hide the surface. I think that was probably the fact that in that, between my first and second year, Um, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and started seeing a a psychiatrist and started seeing a counselor. And there was this like huge part of that of like, well, I need, you're going through this huge struggle on the inside. 
and you can't always show it on the outside, but you're falling apart. And it was the, the heavy texturing and struggling and the physicality of the work all was cathartic. By the time I got to the end, I think I was, uh, I was turned on by my, my counselor. He was just like, oh, yeah, you ever heard of the philosopher Martin Buber um, or Berber? I, I'm still not sure how to pronounce it. <laughs> he was a Jewish uh, philosopher, and he has a book, The I Thou, and I, I read good portions of it, not the whole thing. But he, he talks about how humans relate to one another and how we can see each other. And he said that the his his way of thinking the highest level of human interaction was the I thou, where I see myself in all of my complexities, and I see you as a thou in all of your complexities, and I choose uh, to interact with you as such. Uh, and he had several other ways that we can relate: the I, it, the I, them, stuff like that. And so I was just like, man, if I understood all of that that there is this way in which we present ourselves even though we are complex especially when you first meet someone you present yourself as something somewhat simplistic or not as deep as you are um you know the a way of getting around that would be the the simple term of like trauma dumping <laughs> you know when you meet somebody uh, and so I was like, man, what if I took all of this texture, all of this struggle, all of these complexities, all of these subtleties, and I flattened them from a distance? And it's like, well, what, what color does that? <laughs> what color turns something into a silhouette? I was like, black. Black turns it into a silhouette. And black is also serious. And black is heavy. And the work looks heavy, especially when you're making those big sculptures. They looked heavy and they were heavy. <laughs> like there was there was no lie there. There was there was no trickery. Uh, but when it came to the pots continuing in the black, it, it meant that it continued with this idea of uh, stillness and, and seriousness. Uh, and it, it also gives you something that's striking, at least hopefully, if, if I'm doing it right, it gives you something that's striking in form. And the closer you get to it, the more you investigate. And I think that was something that Bede Clark, I remember him saying that on stage at my first NSEC at Houston in, I want to say, 2014. And he was actually the visiting artist I lobbied. Oh, I lobbied for years in grad school to get him. And I got, he was the last visiting artist my final year. And he actually got to come into my studio and look at my work. And I, I remember him at Ensika saying, like, I want my pots to have layers. Good art has layers. The more you investigate it, the more you see. And so visually hiding in black for me is a very simple way of adding a way to obscure all of the complexities going on in the surface. In terms of the, the technical parts of this, you spray on, is it underglaze that's the black color? Yes. Okay. And then what is on top of it? Because it has like a slight sheen of some short sort, but it's not glaze. No. Yeah. So... With what I'm doing right now, before, when I was in grad school, it was all single fire cone 10 reduction. Um, but I realized a few years ago that I'm going to be moving. <laughs> uh, after Baltimore, uh, we moved to Dayton and now we're in PA and so, or Dayton, Ohio. And so like we, my wife and I, Unity, we just keep moving from place to place to place. And not everyone has uh, cone 10 reduction or the ability to mix your own clay bodies. And so I had to find some way to keep the black. 
but make it work anywhere I go. And cone six, oxidation, almost guaranteed that anywhere you go, that's an option. And so I, I haven't been able to mix my own clay in years. I'm starting to be able to now because I have a Peter Pugger at East Stroudsburg where I am, which is a real blessing. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, it's underglaze, Amico's underglaze on the outside. And then Eric Botbill gave me the recipe for a lithium wash, which is two cups of lithium, two cups of Gersley borate dissolved in four gallons of water. And so every piece gets a bath. It just fully submerged in that. That's the secret. I'm giving out the secret here. <laughs> it was given to me for free, so I'll give it out for free. And you just submerge it in the bath. You wait till there's no more bubbles. You pull it out. You wipe off any touching surfaces. And then you fire it. Uh, well, and then I glaze the inside, of course. I wait for it to dry, glaze the inside. And it, it works. Uh, I actually went to Ceramic Supply in Lodi this weekend and uh they tell me that lithium is like doubled in price and wow. it's already expensive and i'm just like oof we might be we might be looking into a substitute i think they use it in batteries it's lithium batteries is why it's gotten so expensive is lodi your closest ceramic supply because that is mine also i live in new jersey yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's about an hour well, yeah, about an hour. And then driving back, I think I hit traffic. It was an hour and 20. Yeah, because we, we drive through your town on the way going south to go to Virginia to see uh -oh. family. So I, when I first saw you at Stroudsburg, I was like, I think I know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. Awesome. It's pretty small. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I talk, uh, whenever I talk to someone, I'm just like, yeah, East Stroudsburg. And they usually have like a puzzled look on their face. And it's just like, oh, you're, you're not familiar with your under 5,000 student populations of Eastern Pennsylvania, higher education. <laughs> well, well, yeah, let's, let's wrap up the interview talking about your experience there. You're the Frederick Douglass scholar, I believe is your title, which is yep. uh, a lot to live up to. <laughs> Did, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, what what was it like to come to am I right in thinking this is a majority white institution? Yes. Okay. So you're coming in as a named Frederick Douglass scholar into a mostly white school. What what's been the dynamics in terms of finding community there and feeling like that they understand you or you understand them? And I mean the students. Yeah. Oh man. ESU. It's unlike anywhere that I've taught. <laughs> I've taught I've, I don't, there's a part of me that wants to play the song of like, I've been everywhere, man. <laughs> I, I've, I've been everywhere. Like, cause I, I've taught in some places, um, taught at Indiana University and then went to Baltimore Clayworks and taught everybody. I was teaching kids in summer camp. I got to work with the, the learning disabled taught high school in the inner city, um, taught adult classes, and then taught at a, and then went to the University of Dayton where I taught adjunct. So that's a Catholic private school. And now I'm at ESU, which is public school. And uh, ESU is unlike any of them. <laughs> um, I will admit, I, I have more uh, students with Hispanic last names than I expected, which that, that was kind of a, that was kind of a surprise. Um, and I have a, I have a few students of color every semester, which is exciting. And I actually have a ceramics major, um, from Philly who's black as well, which is pretty cool. And so I, I've enjoyed my time teaching at ESU. It's been challenging, uh, as the student body at ESU is unlike any of the others that I've taught at, we, uh, in that we have a very low um, standard for getting into ESU. Uh, so I have a lot of students who are kind of all over the board. I have students who are incredibly driven and excited. And the majority of classes that I'm teaching are entry-level gen eds. So the majority of my students, and that's, that's, that's how any department works, 
Um, and so I have only a few students who are, are really serious about clay. And so getting students excited can be difficult at times. Uh, and as a Frederick Douglass scholar, I, I work within the classroom, but I think a lot of that work actually shows itself outside. So I'm trying to bring the community outside of the arts into making. And so this last semester I did, over the summer I did one, and then this semester I did two uh, workshops for making mugs, which was a blast. So I invited faculty, staff, put it out to the entire university. Um, so people brought their, some people brought their families. And so we just had a afternoon of just making a slab mug. And it was a really great way to just open the ceramic studio and have people come in and make stuff. So we had everyone from university administrators to students to grandparents, just all in the same place, all learning at the same time, smiles, and it was just a good time. And then they left it, I glazed it, and then they're coming and they're picking them up. I still have two in the studio that I got to get to owners and that adds a little bit of work. Um, and that's exciting. And next semester, we're going to do empty bowls. So I'm organizing that with um, the Dean of Health and Science. And we're going to work with, uh, I think, uh, we're going to rent a place and have the meal and everything. And that's going to go to the ESU food pantry. But again, that's going to be like two days for this upcoming semester where we're going to, I'm going to invite the greater community to come out and make because I I strongly believe in community and I, I strongly believe in the arts as being a way to draw people together from different places uh, under the idea that, hey, you, you can make, you can do something, and this is, this is for you. And so I, at first I was really, I was like, man, Frederick Douglass, man, that's going to be I got to put together some big elaborate plan. And now I'm just like, oh no, I just have to work. I, I'm just going to go into this about community. This is going to be about bringing people in. Um, I know that for myself, and I know that you've definitely seen it. The ceramics community is an incredibly welcoming place. Um, but like, how do you get into the ceramics community? It's like, well, I'm going to invite people. I'm going to invite people to come and to make. And even if it's a short-term thing, like you can do this. I think that's that was a really exciting thing. It's like, you know, I started the the mug workshop. I'm like, we're sketching things out. I'm just like, sketch anything. Sketch every mug you've ever seen and remembered. All right, let's see. Okay, let me give the demonstration of how we're going to make some stuff. And it's exciting just to get people to start. And so it's 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 been a different experience at ESU trying to get it. And it was really daunting in the beginning, but I think I'm starting to really find some groove uh, with the community and, and calling people forward to make. I like that you got administrators in there because because getting their hands in clay, I think is important because if they only know the art department as the budget, you know, like it costs X amount to keep <laughs> yeah. your studio open, they don't understand. Like, no, this is, like you said, art making is a way to build community. And a lot of colleges need that unifying factor. A lot of times it's sports, you know, like I went to university of Florida and sports was really the thing that brought everyone together. If there was not that there wouldn't be that many similarities between an art major, a physics PhD, you know, all these different mm -hmm. programs. Yeah. So I like that making could be that at East Stroudsburg. I definitely agree with that. So let's uh, plug the show you've got coming up. You said you have a solo show coming up in January. Can you tell us about that? It's going to be, uh, the name of it is Construct, making forms for it now. I'm going to show some older uh, monuments that I actually still have, uh, but alongside for the first time, pots. And so I'm going to work in some, some wall pieces, and I want to say it's going to open uh, middle to late January, and it's going to run through up until March. I don't have the exact dates, but I know it'll it'll be showing up soon on the ESU uh, Madeline Powers Gallery website, which I want to say is off of ESU's website. And I'll definitely be putting, putting the dates on my Instagram. And that, that'll be exciting. And then coming up in 
April, um, I've got a duo show with Brian Hopkins at Saratoga. And we finally decided on a title, which is, um, oh God, I hope I don't butcher it, uh, <laughs> Architectonics, something like that which should be uh, really exciting to have our work side by side because we we both take a lot of inspiration from architecture and geological phenomena. I've got a few things for the semester <laughs> to work towards. And can you leave your Instagram so people can get in touch if they'd like to talk? Yeah, uh, my Instagram is Wes Brown Creates. All one word, keeping it simple. Nice. <laughs> well, thanks, man. I really appreciate this. It was good to talk with you. And no problem. Thanks for inviting me out. I feel uh, super honored to be invited. I've, I've, I've listened to you and I'm just like, oh man, I'll never. It's the, it's the variable Joe Rogan of ceramics. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. I'd like to thank Wes for coming on the show. I appreciate the time that he gave me and for talking about his work. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, we would love to have you. And I wanted to thank today's sponsors, Amico Brent, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of this show or any of those on our network, you can get in touch through the network website, which is brickyardnetwork.org. Also wanted to put a plug out there for the Archie Bray residency, which the deadline for this year's applications is February the 15th. So if you're interested in being a part of the residency, you can apply today at archiebray.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.